Something happened, and actually in Libya, it was on the news, the execution of Libyan Christians, and I think it was in February of, of 2015. On the beach. And that, that shocked, yeah, that yeah. shocked me to the core. Mm -hmm. uh, they just, seeing that on the news, I felt just a deep personal conviction that I was like, man, they showed more faith in like five minutes of their execution than I've ever done my whole life. So that really made me kind of encouraged me to see my faith as something outside of my family like let's see it as something personal and i think just two months after that just after like reflection like introspections like hey man do i really believe this jesus person do i really believe in his gospel after two months of the reflection i was like man i i never believed i need i need to believe and and these Libyan christians were such a huge inspiration where it's like man i need to i need to deny myself maybe not on a beach but here in houston texas i can and I put my faith in Jesus two months afterwards, and that's that's kind of where it all started, brother. Welcome to the Eden Podcast, where we true the verse of Genesis 3.16, and we discover that God didn't curse Eve or Adam or limit woman in any way. I'm Bruce C.E. Fleming, Executive Director of the True 316 Foundation, and we're the home of the Eden Podcast. We're happy to have a special guest with us this Day. And uh, Joanne, why don't you introduce him to us? Thank you, Bruce. I'd love to. We're here with Osvaldo Valdez, who graduated in 2022 with a master's in divinity from Houston Christian University and is currently both a member of and church intern with Cornerstone Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Houston, Texas. He's also the program director of Life Tree Ministries, a ministry serving the refugee community in Houston with the love of Jesus, and until recently, co-host for the Cases podcast concerning women in ministry. Osvaldo is married to his greatest friend, Megan Green, an inspiration in his ministry journey. And we're glad to have you with us, Oz. Oh, no, thank you so much. It is, it is, it is an honor to be here with y'all. Thank you. Oz, I first heard you as a co-host with uh, Pastor Todd. And uh, yeah. How did that how did you end up being an intern with him? So around 2017, I was like a freshman in college. Uh there was a, a nasty church split and, uh, uh that kind of took us away from the church we were in and we were like looking for churches to be in. And one Sunday, my my brother and I were like, "Hey, let's visit this Presbyterian church." And my parents were like, "Let's visit this Baptist church." So we all went our separate ways that one Sunday and we came back with good news. We're like, man, this is church is it. This is awesome. Anyways, long story short, we got our, our father's blessing for me and my brother to congregate at this church. So we were there for about a year or two when Pastor Todd came in as the new pastor. And when he found out that I wanted to do ministry and I wanted to be involved in, in, in pastoral ministry specifically, he was like, hey, let me take you under my wing. And that's kind of where it all started. Uh, just a, a conversation at a pizza place, actually. And that's, yeah, I just can't believe how all the things that happened after that, that, that pizza. Well, we all know that pizza is equivalent to manna from heaven. So uh, <laughs> uh, facts, uh, facts, yeah. It was a blessing to you. Okay, so let's ask you question number one that we like to ask. Can you tell us about your faith story, how you came to Christ and began to grow? Yeah, so I grew up in, in the church, both of my parents uh, are Christians. We had a very um, avid Christian life. Uh, we would go to church four to five times a week. Looking back, I don't know how it happened. My dad's a, a full-time plumber and he works for a company, uh, has his own company, but somehow managed church and, and admits it all. And so we, we grew up in the church, my whole family, but faith wasn't personal. It was just kind of the accident of my birth type situation. And and I like Jesus. I liked all that stuff. Never took it seriously. I saw church as a social club. It's where I had my friends. We all went as a family. But it wasn't until my, in high school where I was really confronted with my faith. I went to a school that was predominantly Muslim. And they, they're more serious than I ever could be. And they started asking questions, questions that I never asked, uh, uh, questions about Jesus, questions about my scriptures. And then I was like, man, do, do I really believe this? Right. And and then something something happened. And actually in Libya, it was on the news, the execution of Libyan Christians. And I think it was in February of, of 2015 on the beach. And that, that shocked. Yeah, that yeah. shocked me to the core. Mm -hmm. uh, they just seeing that on the news, I felt just a deep personal conviction that I was like, man, 
they showed more faith in like five minutes of their execution than I've ever done my whole life. So that really made me kind of encourage me to see my faith as something outside of my family. Like, let's see it as something personal. And I think just two months after that, just after like reflection, like introspections, like, hey, man, do I really believe this Jesus person? Do I really believe in his gospel? After two months of the reflection, I was like, man, I, I never believe. I need I need to believe. And and these Libyan Christians were such a huge inspiration. Where it's like, man, I need to I need to deny myself. Maybe not on a beach, but here in Houston, Texas, I can. And I put my faith in Jesus two months afterwards. And that's that's kind of where it all started, brother. That's kind of where it all started. And it was a it's been it's been a journey ever since, as you as you know. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. So then then you uh so you go to you go off to university. Where where did yeah. you where did you go to school? I went to a school. Well, back in the day, it was called Houston Baptist University, but the staff was like all all over the place in a good way. I find that as a huge blessing. Uh, they recently, actually, just last year, changed their name to Houston Christian University, but that's uh, that's kind of where I went. I went there for for five years. I actually met my wife there, and uh, they have a, a school of Christian thought there, and that's where that's where I studied all these five years. Well, then at the same time, you're in your local church. So let, why don't you tell us now your your ministry story? How how you got from there to where you are now? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, the whole the whole thing started at a church in the Katy area, so like West Houston, uh, full all Hispan all Spanish speaking church, and uh, I was a new Christian, super involved. I understood why my parents did church four to five times a week. You know, it's not for everybody, but like I understood for the first time, and I was man head on. I loved it. Uh, interestingly, so. That was that church was the first time I interacted with a, the idea or the concept of egalitarianism in the first place. And it was actually an incredibly negative experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the church split over the pastor's theology. Um, he started doing something kind of sneaky. Um, he started passing out his his master's dissertation to to all the women in the church and like purposely hid it from. He's like encouraging them to read it personally. Don't show it to your husband and everything. And he gave it to my mom, and my mom's like, "Hey, take this read because you're you know you're 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 pursuing ministry. Check this out." And I read it, and it was it was a type of egalitarianism that kind of puts Paul and Jesus at odds. You know, like Paul, product of his time. You know, he was wrong. As Christians, we're followers of Jesus, not Paul. And that was that was some weird. So I didn't understand it very well at the time, but like something was off about it. And anyways, the church found out about it. The church ended up splitting because he he was so convinced that Paul was wrong. Paul had a wrong theology, and and my first experience was, man, egalitarianism is bad because it splits churches. You know, it's like, oh yeah. man, I don't like this because it oh. it it makes the Bible wrong. And it's funny because it is in that context that I felt a call to ministry. I was like, man, I I want to teach people good sound theology, and it's, it was a product of of that. So that's where it all started. My call to ministry started in, in that context of a church. Uh, from that Baptist church, we moved. I moved to this Presbyterian church where I met Pastor Todd. He took me under his wing, and then that—that's where things started changing radically. You know, uh, Todd was exe exegesis was his his nickname, right? He was just like, "Hey, let's let's be good students of the Bible." It's like, all right, and he started introducing me to great authors. So when you about. when you excuse me when you first met yeah. Todd. Um, we're not an official egalitarian ministry here. We're, we're yeah. just, you know, True Three Sixteen Foundation. We're we're just talking about the scripture. We're trying to go back to the original yeah. Hebrew and Greek. But what was your uh, what was your position personally, and what was Todd's position when you first hooked up? Uh, traditional complementarian, whatever that means, right? Because like, oh, something that I learned very, very, very. When I started look diving into all this. All, all those terms are loaded, right? Like they mean a million different things to whoever you talk to. So I guess on paper we're complementarian, but uh, I I realized very very early that I had a very I don't I don't know weird perspective on men and women in general. Uh, my upbringing is right. Our own life experiences really shaped that. From my father's side, there was a there was a matriarchy. My my grandmother. She was mother to 12 children, and she commanded full authority over life choices, over everything, full, full on. When she passed away, my dad took over that role, that family role. So it switched from a matriarchy to a patriarchy. So growing up, I only really had those two sides, right? It's either one side's in control 
or the other side's in control. So I came with that baggage. That's what I like to call it. I came to that baggage when I read the Bible, and that's the baggage that I came when I came with Todd. So it would Todd be, we, we, could call it, we could call it authoritarian. Yeah. 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 One way or the other, it was still, you know, there's somebody on authority. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. I was scared of my grandmother. She lived with us for like six years, and she really, <laughs> boom, her authority. Anyways. When I met Todd, that's when it all changed, right? He just kind of, that was my world. I just thought that's how it's supposed to be. Uh, Todd, on the other hand, was like, no, nah, not really. I don't think that that's healthy at all. Uh, it, and it all started not never not in the context of like, hey, let's let's take a closer look into the hard passages, whether it be First Timothy or whatever it may be. It all started with, um, with uh, abuse, right? How do we address abuse in the church? That's where the whole conversation started. Why should the church address abuse? Because, right, men and women are valuable. Right? God cares for these people. So that's where it all started with Todd. I was like, oh, he has a very different view on on, on men and women. Um, so uh, with Todd, it was more like, hey, we're a lot more similar, a lot more equal than we realized it. He avoided titles at all costs. But that's kind of where it all started, brother, mm-hmm. with Todd. So so when when you're thinking about your journey from thinking more about authoritarian models for relationships, you know, family and church and whatnot to what sounds to me like a more mutual kind of engagement with in families for partners and church. What was that like then? How, how did your reading of the scriptures? Cause you said it affected how you read the scriptures. How did, how did that change? Cause there's an arc here. Yeah. It, It all, it all changed with just the subject of deacons. For me, it was just like a weird subject about of all things. Phoebe, I was like, it's just weird. It's just one of those titles. Oh, she, she, she gets called a deaconess. And for me, something just like tweaked, something like was off in the sense that no one questions when a guy gets called a deacon. But the amount of articles and the overwhelming literature as to why Phoebe isn't really a deaconess, you know, and then the official sense or the ordained sense, however you want to name it, depending on your tradition. Uh, that was for me just suspicious. I was like, that's weird. You know, we never invest this much energy on anyone else, a dude named called a deacon. But why all this energy invested in in a woman? So that's when I, I talked to Todd about it. And I was nervous because I was like, man, this is going to expose me as, I don't know. I don't know. I was just nervous, right? And I got like just the weirdest reaction from Todd because I was, he was just like, I want you to look more into that. He's like, because we're, we're actually more similar than we realize. And he, at that time, he told me to keep it private because our denomination wasn't, uh, just wasn't too friendly, you know, around around that subject. So he just told me, keep it quiet and come come to me after your research. I'm like, all right. So I spent like a year just taking a closer look at church history. Let's take a closer look at, at these passages that that allude to women, you know, serving at an official capacity, however that may look like. And then I was like, Pastor Todd, I, I'm, I'm convinced. Like, I think women are have been deacons for the longest time ever. And I think the scriptures sanctioned this. And once again, nervous. I was like, man, now I'm going to get kicked out of an intern. And instead he was like, he's like, I'm just glad. I'm happy for you. I'm happy you're able to do something that I can't do. Because he was, it just it just sucked that as a pastor, there's certain things you can't say or you lose your job, you know? So anyways, that's how it all started for me. Just like mm-hmm. taking a closer look at the deacon situation. And then in my mind, I was like, man, if this required a second look, I wonder what else requires a second look. And, and it was just kind of like things just started unraveling from there. Yeah. True 316 Foundation is the home of the Eden Podcast. Join us for $3.16 a month or more. Let's chew the verses on the key passages on women and men. Go to true316.com slash partner. True 316 is strengthening and encouraging many, and we're getting stories every day of lives changed through our ministry. We're the home of the Eden Podcast, and we're getting the word out that God didn't curse Eve or Adam or limit woman in any way. Our volunteer help is wonderful, and we grow stronger with each new true partner who gives to the True 316 Foundation so that we can cover the costs to do the technical work of the Eden Podcast, to coordinate our true school workshops like the two-week Eden Workshop on Genesis 2 and 3, and to make the True 316 Foundation function in its outreach to scholars and students around the world. You can give now with a one-time gift. And better still, you can join now and become a monthly donor. We call our monthly donors our true partners. Please join now by going to true316.com slash partner.